Last week, all of Facebook's services were offline for about five hours, and I thought it'd be interesting to discuss it. And we'll start with the idea that every computer on the internet has a numerical IP address that it uses to communicate. And so one of the first things that has to happen when you type in something like www.facebook.com is that your computer has to look up the IP address for Facebook. And the way that works is using DNS, the domain name system. But that just begs the question, how do you find the IP address of the DNS servers? Well, ultimately, it all starts with the root servers. There's a well-known public list of 13 IP addresses for the root DNS servers. And the list is maintained by the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, which everyone just kind of trusts. But the actual servers are operated by different corporations, uh, educational institutions, government and, and military agencies, uh, and, and various nonprofits. So really no single entity or interest controls the Internet. And now all of these root servers provide the same information. Um, and each server has a well-known published IP address. And those are all listed here. So for example, this root server has the IP address of 198.41.0.4. And an IP address is really just a 32-bit number, but it's always written out as four 8-bit numbers separated by dots like that. But anyway, everyone agrees that these 13 IP addresses are the authoritative DNS root servers. So we can send a request to any of them to try to figure out the IP address for something. So for example, here I'll do a DNS lookup from one of the root servers, so 198.41.0.4, and that's this root server here. So we're going to ask that root server what it knows about www.facebook.com. And so if we do that, we get back a whole bunch of information. But if we look at what we actually got, it says we queried for one thing, and we actually got zero answers. So this is not actually going to answer our request, but it did give us a bunch of other information. So it's saying here our question was www.facebook.com. We're looking for an internet address. That's what, we're, that's what we're after. It doesn't give us an answer, but it does give us some other authority. So it says that all of these different servers are authoritative for com. And so what it's saying is the, the root server is saying, okay, you're looking for www.facebook.com. Well, I don't know anything about that, but I do know about com, this top-level domain. And if you want to know anything about the com top-level domain, well, then you can talk to any of these 13 servers, which coincidentally um, are managed by the same organizations that, that operate the root servers. But in any event, it says we can ask any of these uh, generic top-level domain servers for more information about the com domain. Um, and then it also provides us this additional section which has some glue records that gives us the IP addresses for each of these servers that are authoritative for the top-level com domain. And I'll note that in all of these cases, we have this IP address that we've been talking about, as well as an IPv6 address. And the difference is that an IP address is a 32-bit number, which is written out as four 8-bit numbers uh, separated by dots, whereas an IPv6 address is a 128-bit number that's written out in a hexadecimal uh, uh, format. And the internet is slowly moving towards uh, adopting IPv6 more broadly because it supports a much bigger address space. And so we could have just as easily used this IPv6 address and asked the same question. So we could ask that IPv6 address what it knows about www.facebook.com. And we would get the same answer. So this is the exact same answer. It says, oh, well, for com, you've got to talk to one of these servers. But anyway, for the rest of the video, I'm going to be focused on IPv4 because the numbers are sort of easier to make sense of. So anyway, the next step is once we've got this answer saying that, okay, for com, you need to talk to one of these servers, well, then we can ask one of those servers. So 192.12.94.30 was one of the servers that is authoritative for com. And we can ask it what it knows about www.facebook.com. So if we run that, we get another answer here where it says, okay, we queried for one thing, we got zero answers. So we didn't, still didn't quite get the answer for who www.facebook.com is. But what this is now saying is that you need to talk to a different server that is authoritative for facebook.com. And in that case, it lists these four name servers that are authoritative for facebook.com. And it gives us the glue records here that give us the actual IP addresses. So now if we kind of take the next step, and ask one of these servers, so 129.134.30.12, for example. If we ask that server what www.facebook.com is, here we get a result where we are getting an actual answer. It says we got one answer. So our question was, what is www.facebook.com? We're looking for an internet address. The answer is that www.facebook.com is actually an alias, and the canonical name 
for www.facebook.com is starmini.c10r.facebook.com. So we still don't actually have the IP address of www.facebook.com. We're kind of going further down the rabbit hole. So we are actually need to find the IP address for this name here, starmini.c10r.facebook.com. Well, we already know it's facebook.com. So we'll ask the server that is authoritative for facebook.com, which is the server we just asked here, to see what it knows about this star mini thing. And when we make that request, wouldn't you know it, we don't get an answer. What we see is we see another authority section. We see, okay, you're asking for something within the c10r.facebook.com subdomain. Well, for that, you've got to go talk to one of these name servers. So we'll go ahead and ask that same question, but instead of using one of the facebook.com name servers, we'll use one of these c10r.facebook.com servers. So that's this one here, 185.89.218.11. And if we make that request, we actually get an answer. So we get an answer again. So starmini.c10r.facebook.com, we're looking for an address, and we actually get an address. And the address is 157.240.22.35. And so that is, in fact, at least for me, and at least right now, that is the IP address that I should talk to if I want to talk to facebook.com. But in order to figure out what that address was, we had to start with the root servers. And then they're able to tell us about the top level domain servers, which are authoritative for .com. And then those top level domain servers are then able to tell us about which servers are authoritative for facebook.com. And then it was those servers that are actually able to tell us about www.facebook.com. But then they just said that it's an alias for starmini.c10r.facebook.com and that there's actually different DNS servers that are authoritative for that c10r.facebook.com domain. And so it was finally those servers that were able to tell us the IP address of Facebook's web server. Now for each of these zones, there are multiple addresses, and, and, and of course that's for redundancy. Um, and actually each of those addresses is likely served by multiple servers in different locations. Uh, but still, we need at least one address from each of these four zones to be reachable and, and operating in order for this whole process to work. Though I should say that in reality, your computer probably doesn't actually go through this whole process. So on my computer here, uh, if I'm looking at my network settings, if I go look at DNS, it's got some DNS servers configured. And these are actually caching name servers that are run by my ISP. So for example, 75.75.75.75 is run by Comcast, which happens to be my internet service provider. So if I just do a lookup for www.facebook.com and I don't specify a server, it'll use that Comcast caching name server that my computer's is configured to use. And you can see that's what it used here, 75.75.75.75. And it's sending the query and it's getting back two answers. And the query is here, www.facebook.com, we're looking for an internet address. And it's getting the two answers. It's saying that uh, facebook.com is actually an alias, and the canonical name is starmini.c10r.facebook.com. That's the same as we saw before. And then it's saying that the star mini, it's got an internet address of 157.240.22.35. So we're getting the same answer as we got before, but instead of going through that whole exercise of going to the root server and working our way down, we can send a single request to my ISP's caching name server and, and you know basically get the same answer right away. But of course, this caching name server still has to go through that whole process, but then it can cache the answer. So if someone else wants to know what Facebook's IP address is, it can just answer directly, which is which actually probably what happened in this case. And actually, the, the authoritative name servers say how long each result can be cached. So if we scroll up here, we can see that the, the root server said uh, that you know the fact that these name servers are authoritative for .com can be cached for 172,800 seconds, which is uh, 48 hours. And then you know the IP addresses for those can also be cached for 48 hours. Uh, and then the top level domain servers, when we asked about Facebook, it said that Facebook's name servers can, can also be cached for uh, 48 hours. But then Facebook's name server says that the www.facebook.com, you know, that alias to, to star mini, can only be cached for 3,600 seconds or, or one hour. And then the mapping uh, down here of that you know, star mini.c10r.facebook.com to the actual IP address can only be cached for 60 seconds. And you know, th these intervals here are, are something that Facebook has set up. So there's you know, sort of a trade-off between letting it be cached for a long time versus being able to change this address relatively quickly to handle failures or changing load or whatever. So Facebook has that set pretty aggressively low at 60 seconds. But anyway, what this tells me is that even though this address I'm getting from my ISP, it might have been cached, my ISP would have had to have gone back to Facebook's authoritative name server sometime in the last 60 seconds 
to, to get the, the updated uh, address. In fact, I can see that because this expires in 33 seconds, I know my ISP actually got this information uh, would have been 27 seconds before I requested it from them. So even with caches, it's really important that at least one root server, top-level domain server, at least one of Facebook's name servers, and apparently also a subdomain server, are all operational in order to get the IP address for Facebook's website. So if somehow all four Facebook name servers were unreachable, no one would be able to get the IP address for any other Facebook service. And of course, that's what happened last week. All four of Facebook's name server addresses were inaccessible. So what does that mean that they're inaccessible? You know, I mean, let's say we've gone through this process of talking to root servers and top-level domain servers, and now we need to talk to one of Facebook's name servers. We've got an IP address for it, 129.134.30.12, let's say. How does data get from my computer to that IP address? Um, and really, for that matter, how does data get from my computer to any IP address? Well, my computer, of course, has an IP address of its own. In this case, it's uh, 172.16.0.223. So, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but at least at a minimum, my computer is going to know how to get to this address 172.16.0.223 because that's itself. But it's also got this subnet mask, 255.255.255.0. And if you convert that to binary, you get 24 ones followed by eight zeros. And the meaning of that is that it says that the first 24 bits of this IP address describe the local network that I'm connected to, and the last eight bits, so in this case, this 223, describe a single device on that network. So if you change any of the last eight bits of this IP address, you just get another IP address that's on my local Wi-Fi network. But for any other address that I might want to find that doesn't match that, there's this router configured. So that's 172.16.0.1. And of course, the first 24 bits of that match my local IP address. So we can tell that the router is on the local Wi-Fi network here, which is good because we don't know how to get to anywhere else just yet. But now that we've got this router configured, that's going to be our default gateway to get to any other IP addresses on the internet. And another way to look at this is to look at my computer's routing table. And this shows routes to a bunch of different destinations. And we can see we've got 172.16.0.223. And that's my computer's IP address. And it says all 32 bits have to match. So my computer knows how to get to itself. But here's 172.16/24. So any IP where the first 24 bits match 172.16.0. something is connected to the same Wi-Fi network that I'm on. But for most other addresses, there's this default route. And the next hop is the gateway of 172.16.0.1. And that 172.16.0.1 belongs to my router on my home network that sits between the wireless access point and the cable modem that connects to my ISP. And you can see that router's got two interfaces, and, and this one here is the 172.16.0.1, and this other one connects over to the cable modem. And I can actually connect to my router and poke around. If I secure shell to 172.16.0.1, and if we look at the interfaces, you can see that Ethernet 1 is assigned this address of 172.16.0.1, and then Ethernet 0 has this 24.6.218.102 address, which is assigned by my ISP since Ethernet 0 is connected to my cable modem. And if we look at the routing table, it's pretty simple. We see this 172.16.0/24 network is connected to uh, Ethernet 1, and then the 24.6.216/21 network is directly connected to Ethernet 0. And this slash 21 means that the first 21 bits of this are the network, and then the 11 remaining bits are used for identifying me and about 2,000 other homes in my neighborhood. And so my address of 218.102 falls within that 216.0 slash 21 uh, range. And then this is the default route here. So it says that for any other address that matches if we compare zero bits, so that's uh, be any address, uh, send it out my cable modem, and the next hop is uh, 24.6.216.1, and that would be a router at my ISP that I'm directly connected to. So this is all pretty straightforward. Every device on my network has a default route that points traffic in one direction, towards a bigger network. But once you get to an internet service provider's network, you can't do that anymore. The ISP's routers don't have a default route. They need to know where everything is. So to see what that looks like, I'm connected here to a router on AT&T's network that I happen to have access to. And if we look at the routing table on this router, First thing I'll point out is that this routing table has information for 845,478 destinations. And those destinations, e each destination refers to an address prefix that can cover a big block of addresses. But, but all of these 845,000 destinations together cover the entire internet. You can see there's no default route here. And it just starts at 1.0.0.0 and, and goes from there. And you know some blocks are bigger than others. But if we just keep scrolling through here, 
it just goes on and on and has blocks for every active IP address on the internet. And you know, this happens to be AT&T's view of the world, but any large service provider is gonna have a similar looking routing table in their routers. And likewise, Facebook operates a sophisticated global network, so they aren't just gonna have a default route pointing somewhere. And I don't really know any details about Facebook's network, but I mocked up five routers configured you know, close enough to how it might work just to, to kind of show you. And I, you know, I just made up some IP addresses and stuff, but we can uh, poke around and, and look at stuff. So if we're on the Menlo Park router here and we just look at the routing table, you'll see there are you know, 40 destinations. And I, you know, I just made up some IP addresses, but the important point is there's no default route. And I'm pretty confident that Facebook wouldn't be using a default route. So they'd have a full routing table, just like we saw on that AT&T router. But anyhow, since this is supposed to be a mock-up of Facebook's global network, let's add in one of their DNS servers. So a.ns.facebook.com has an address 129.134.30.12. So I just arbitrarily stuck that in Montreal, um, but they almost certainly have multiple DNS servers responding to that address in multiple locations. So I'll add a second server with the same IP address in Amsterdam as well, and that'll work perfectly fine. For example, if we're, you know, we're looking at this routing table on the Menlo Park router, there's a route here in the routing table, 129.134.30.0 slash 24, which covers that DNS server's address. And there are two paths here. And you can see one path goes to Montreal and the other path goes to Amsterdam. And the first one here is selected as the active path, it's a little star means. And the second one is just there serving as a backup. But if we move over to the London router and look at the routing table there, you can see the same 129.134.30/24 route. And it's also got two paths, one going to Montreal, one going to Amsterdam. But the London router selected the Amsterdam one as the, as the preferred route, which, which makes sense. But again, it's got that backup route available as well. So that's a mock-up of Facebook's network. But you know, I also created a mock-up of my ISP's network. And in this case, this one's a lot simpler. I just have a router in San Jose near me and then another router um, just in London, for example. But you can imagine that this ISP might also have routers all over the world. Um, but I'm a customer of this ISP, so my house is connected to their router here in San Jose. So I've mocked that up. If we look at the routing table on this router and specifically look for that address 24.6.218.102, you can see that network is directly connected. And in reality, this would be through the cable modem infrastructure, but I've, I've just got this mocked up. And then the ISP, of course, is gonna ensure that the rest of their network can get to me as well. So if we go to the ISP's London router, there should be a route there as well. And we can see that same route to that same slash 21 network for my neighborhood. And it's advertised from the San Jose router. And the next hop is 10.0.15.2, uh, which is the San Jose router via interface EM2, uh, which is that link on the London router going to San Jose. So, so that all checks out. But so far, none of the routers on my ISP's network know how to get to Facebook's name server. So if we go back to the ISP's uh, San Jose router and look for a route going to Facebook's name server, 129.134.30.12, we get nothing. And remember on these big networks, there's no default route. So any data trying to get to this address would just be dropped because we, we've got no route there. Likewise, if we go back to Facebook's network, so I'll jump over to that Menlo Park router, none of the routers on Facebook's network are gonna have a route back to my cable modem. And of course, I wouldn't expect Facebook to have a default route either. So we've got these two different networks, but they aren't connected to each other in what you might call an internet. But of course, both of these companies, Facebook and the ISP, would benefit from connecting the two networks together. Facebook wants access to the ISP's customers and the ISP's customers want access to Facebook. So we can add a connection between the two networks. Um, but, you know, Facebook isn't exactly a regular customer of the ISP, and the ISP isn't exactly a customer of Facebook, so it's really more of a peer relationship. And so this type of connection between networks is typically referred to as peering. And it's even common that neither side pays the other, because it's just a mutually beneficial thing to do. But uh, anyway, setting up peering uh, can be pretty straightforward. You know, first you need a physical connection between one of Facebook's routers and one of the ISP's routers. So... You know, Menlo Park and San Jose are pretty close to each other, so it might be easy enough to get a fiber optic connection between those two facilities. Um, although it's actually quite common for different companies to put their equipment in the same data center. So maybe both of these London routers are actually in the same data center, and you could actually just run a wire across the room to connect them. So anyway, I've got these connections set up between San Jose and Menlo Park and configured with these IP addresses. So for example, if we look at the interfaces on the Menlo Park router, We've got this EM3 interface configured with uh, the address 10.0.16.2. And if I ping 10.0.16.1, I'm getting replies. So the link is up and, and the Facebook router and the ISP router can send traffic back and forth. 
But what's missing is that Facebook doesn't know what traffic it should send to the ISP, and the, you know, the ISP doesn't know what traffic it should send to Facebook. So what we need to do is we need to exchange routing information across this link that we just created. And the way that's done is using the Border Gateway Protocol, or BGP. And so with BGP, what we do is we set up a TCP connection between the routers uh, to exchange routing information. And I keep track of who owns what routes and what networks they've been advertised through. Every network that's part of the internet has a number assigned to it that's called an autonomous system number. For example, um, 32934 is assigned to Facebook. And so I'll use that in my demo. Um, and then, of course, I've also got the ISP network, and so that needs its own autonomous system number. And uh, AS number 7018 happens to be assigned to AT&T, so I'll just use that for my demo. And all the routers on a particular network are going to be configured with that autonomous system number. So on the ISP side, if we go to, say, the San Jose router and look at the configuration, I've got it configured for autonomous system 7018 already. And then same thing on Facebook. If we were to hop over to one of the Facebook routers, say the Facebook router in New York, you can see I've got the autonomous system configured for 32934, which is Facebook's AS number. And I've already got that configured on all the routers. So to set up the peering between Facebook and this ISP, um, I'll start on the ISP side. So to set up that peering, I'll configure a new BGP neighbor. And that neighbor's gonna have an address of 10.0.16.2, which is the other side of that link uh, to Facebook. And then I'll tell it that the peer autonomous system is 32934. And that's actually it. So I'll commit that change in exit config mode. And so now if we look at the BGP neighbors, there's a neighbor configured for 10.0.16.2, and it's active, which means that it's actively trying to establish a connection. But it's just going to stay in this state now until we configure the other side. So let's go over to the Facebook router now, and it's basically the same thing. Like I said, I've already got all the Facebook routers configured to be in that autonomous system 32934. So we just need to set up the peering on this side. So I'll add a new BGP neighbor with a neighbor address of 10.0.16.1, which is the ISP side of the link. And then I'll tell it that the peer autonomous system is 7018. So I'll commit that change. And if we look at the BGP neighbors, here's our new neighbor, 10.0.16.1, and it's showing as active, so it's actively attempting to establish that connection. If we keep checking it, it should eventually uh, become established and start exchanging routes. And there it goes. So now it's exchanging routes. So we're, we've got uh, 12 active routes, 12 received routes, 12 accepted routes. So we're getting 12 routes from the ISP. And if we go back over to the ISP and look at the BGP neighbors again, here we now see that this neighbor is established. It's been up for 23 seconds and it's receiving 22 routes from Facebook. So now from the ISP, if we look through the routing table, we should see those Facebook routes. So here from San Jose, here's a route to 129.134.30/24, which includes Facebook's name server. And we see we're getting a BGP route, and it shows that the AS path is 32934. So it's telling us that this route has come from Facebook's autonomous system. And then if this ISP were to be peered with another ISP and send this route on to them, then this ISP would prepend its AS number, and this path would keep a record of how many networks the, the route has been advertised through. And it's also used to detect loops, because if you receive a route that includes your own AS number in the path, then you know, well, it must be, there must be a loop or something, and you can discard that route. And now if we jump up to uh, one of Facebook's routers, let's say in Montreal, let's see if there's a route here for my home address, which was uh, 24.6.218.102. And there we go. So now Facebook knows about my home address, and it says to send traffic uh, from Montreal towards Menlo Park. And if we go look at Menlo Park's routing table for 24.6.218.102, it says traffic should be sent towards 10.0.16.1, which is the ISP router in San Jose. Now, it's pretty common for big networks like this to peer in multiple locations, and I'm sure that Facebook peers with big ISPs in probably hundreds of cities. So I can set that up the same way in London. You know, we've got a link here between these two London routers. I've already configured that. And so on the ISP side, if we go to the uh, ISP router in London, it's configured the same way. We'll set up a neighbor address of 10.0.13.2. 
and we'll set up the peer autonomous system from the ISP side looking at Facebook to be Facebook's AS number of 32934. So I'll commit that. And there's our new peer, active. And then on the Facebook side, this is uh, the Facebook router in London. The BGP neighbor is going to be uh, 10.0.13.1. And the peer AS is 7018. So I'll commit that. And we've got that neighbor now. And we'll just give it a minute here and it should uh, become established. And there it is. So that's established now. And so now with both of those peering set up, if we go back to San Jose and look at routes to 129.134.30.12, Facebook's name server, you can see we've got two paths here. One going out interface EM2 towards Menlo Park and the other going out interface EM1 towards London. And of course, it prefers the one going towards Menlo Park. If we were to jump over to London and look at the same route, we see the same two paths. And of course, in this case, the London router prefers sending it to Facebook's London router. So that's a super high level overview of how large networks like Facebook and AT&T connect together to form the internet. So let's take a look at what routing information AT&T really has about Facebook. So now I'm on that router that I've got access to that's uh, actually connected to AT&T's live network. And, you know, as we saw before, it's got about 850,000 routes. But we can look for routes that match a particular autonomous system path. So we can say, show us routes that have been advertised through any network any number of times, but that ultimately originated at AS32934. And that's, of course, Facebook's autonomous system number. So this will show us every route that Facebook is advertising that's eventually making its way to this router somehow. So here's a destination, this uh, 311324, uh, and it's got a whole bunch of different paths to that destination. And here are some more routes, um, but we could, we could simplify this a bit. I'll modify that same command to just give us active paths so we don't have to look at every path for every route. And so here are all of Facebook's IP blocks that they're advertising. And if we keep scrolling down here, we should be able to find that 129.134.30 route. And here it is, 129.134.30 24. And of course, you know, we'd expect to see this route from Facebook, otherwise we wouldn't know how to get to their name server. And so you can see all these routes here. And I actually happened to take a look at this list of routes during Facebook's outage last week as well. And I, I put a list into this uh, spreadsheet here. So this column here is all the routes that Facebook was advertising during the outage. And then this column over here is all the routes that they're advertising right now. And so if we scroll down, you can see there's a handful of routes that they were not advertising during the outage. And critically, that included routes for these networks here that include the A name server, the B name server, the C name server, and the D name server. So this is pretty remarkable. You know, Facebook has got four name servers at four different addresses, and presumably each address is hosted in dozens or maybe even a hundred or more different locations. And Facebook undoubtedly peers with hundreds of other networks, and somehow simultaneously all four routes were withdrawn from every location to every peer. And you know, this sort of thing just isn't supposed to happen. So what did happen? Well, Facebook posted an explanation and they talk about you know, DNS and BGP. And they say that you know, to ensure reliable operation, our DNS servers disable BGP advertisements if they can't speak to their data centers. And I wouldn't think that would normally be a problem. So let's hop back to my simulated Facebook network here. And you know, remember, we've got two DNS servers with uh, address 129.134.30.12. One is in Montreal and one is in Amsterdam. And if we look at the route to that address on any of the other routers, say in New York, that route has two different paths, one to Montreal, one to Amsterdam, so one to each server. So if one of those servers decided it was having problems and disabled BGP advertisements about itself, as Facebook says that they do, then you know, the other one's still there. And from what I can tell, Facebook has about 100 or so peering locations. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they had DNS servers in each of those locations. So that might mean something like 100 different routers disabling route advertisements for their DNS servers almost simultaneously. But that seems to be what they say happened. Now, why that happened, they're not all that clear about. So they say a command was issued which unintentionally took down all the connections in our backbone network. And I don't know, that's not a very satisfying explanation, but unless Facebook wants to tell us more, uh, this is what we've got. The entire network was down because they unintentionally took down the entire network. And you know, beyond all this talk of DNS and BGP, that's, that's really what we're left with. 
And, and the rest of this is an interesting read. You know, they go on to talk a bit about the challenges they had restoring service, and um, that may actually be the bigger story here. You know, mistakes happen, but there's a big difference between a five-minute outage and a five-hour outage. And it sounds like a lot of their time was spent fighting their own security protocols to get the right engineers into their own data centers. And I'm sure they're not going to tell us uh, the details about that. But anyway, I thought this was a good excuse to explain a little bit about DNS and BGP. So hopefully you found that interesting. If you want to learn more about networking, um, actually the very first dozen or so videos I made on this channel seven years ago were actually all about networking. So maybe check them out. And of course, I want to thank all my patrons who make it possible for me to randomly drop everything and make a video about DNS and BGP for no reason. So thank you. <laughs>